and welcome to the Frogs of War podcast. It's great to be back here on what is tonight a uh, Monday night, January the 21st, Martin Luther King Day, not a holiday for the Frogs of War crew. Uh, and uh, joining me tonight, Jamie Plunkett, uh, coming back for a second podcast. We invited him back. We didn't kick him off, which is always a good sign. If you make it through one podcast and get invited back, you know you're doing a good job. Jamie, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well, Patrick. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. Trey Fallon is not going to be joining us tonight. Uh, Trey is uh, still an author on Frogs of War, but he's got some other things going on that uh, he's kicking around in his life. So he'll probably be posting and doing fewer po- posting less and doing fewer podcasts. And uh, we wish him the best, but we certainly still expect him to be writing uh, come fall, ready for football, and uh, he should be a part of the team. So. Just for tonight and going forward, it's going to be Jamie and I talking about TCU sports. And I I think the biggest thing, Jamie, that we could start with is football. Yeah, not basketball, football. Yeah, let's avoid avoid (laughs) basketball for the time being. For the time being, right. We we may talk about it a little bit later. But the biggest news, I think, and correct me uh, if you think I'm wrong, I think the biggest news since the last time we did a podcast is we officially know now that Casey Pahal is going to be a TCU Horned Frog for at least – one semester coming forward, right? We know that he's re-enrolled at TCU. We know that he has been accepted back on the football team because he was at the first team meetings when the team uh, got back last week. And from everything that we've heard, he's on the straight and narrow. He's done what TCU's asked, and they seem to basically be declaring him ready to go. What, what's kind of your take when you've heard that news last week and how is it processing? And would you say that that is the biggest factor going into two, 2013? Or are there other things that you think need to happen for us to feel really good about, about what's going to be going on next year? Well, you know, I, I, it can never be up to one player to really, really affect a season too much. Uh, obviously, when we lost Paul Hall uh, in the middle of last year, it did have a major effect on the team. But moving forward, I think there are a few little pieces here or there that we can fill in. Uh, some through recruiting, which we'll get get to in a second. Um, but obviously having having your star quarterback back is going to be a huge uh, piece of the puzzle moving forward. Um, it, it's good to know for sure that he's coming back. I was excited to hear that he was officially back on campus and back with the team uh, simply because he makes everyone around him better. And if he is actually back and healthy and in the right state of mind and completely dedicated to keeping himself on the straight and narrow, then I think this is going to be an incredibly positive impact for the team. Um, The fact of the matter is, regardless of whether people like to hear it or not, he's a better passer than Trayvon Boykin. He's a better leader. Um, And that doesn't mean that Boykin can't improve in those two areas. But for now, moving forward, I would feel more comfortable, honestly, with having a proven guy in the, uh, taking snaps um, for this team. And so, you know, I, I really think that it, it's a major positive. Um, the thing is, is that he hasn't been working out. He hasn't been throwing a football. Obviously, he's had a lot larger issues on his mind uh, that he's had to handle. Um, and I think, you know, that with this time in the spring, with um, you know, with the the eight or nine months that he has to get back in football shape, start throwing a football, start really you know working on his timing with his receivers in spring practice and that kind of thing, uh, he will be in game shape by August without an issue. If this was June or July, I would be much more concerned about him not having picked up a football in quite some time. No, it's interesting. I don't disagree with. My my previous thought on this whole thing, which has just really simply been that ultimately Casey Paul Hall is the quarterback that could lead this team to a Big 12 championship next year. Uh, you know, it, can Trevon Boykin lead us to a Big 12 championship in 2013? I don't think so. Yeah, that's my personal opinion. I, I think he's going to be better next year. I think he's going to be even better in 2014. Uh, but if you had to say, you know, if you're putting down Vegas money, on who's going to be the better quarterback in 2013, who brings us the best chance to make it to the Big 12 championship or win the Big 12 championship, I should say, since there's no championship game. I I think that has to be Casey Pahal. What's interesting, the dynamic that you mentioned there, you you thought that he he probably is a better leader. I don't know that that's not true, right? I don't know if he is or is not. I think that's going to be a big part of the spring, though. I think that one of his biggest tasks which it sounds like he's already starting to address by talking openly with his teammates, is listen, kind of the listen, guys, I'm sorry I let you down, but I, it won't happen again. You can trust me. 
Uh, and I think that'll be a really big piece of the kind of spring practice, spring football story is how this team molds around Casey Pahal. There were certainly rumors that maybe Josh Boyce did not want to come back if Casey Pahal was back on the team, that he had some kind of, there was animosity there. Who knows if that's true? Never been actually printed in any kind of official manner. But it'll be interesting to see how things work out. And, of course, let, let's not forget, if the TCU offensive line is as good or worse than it was in 2012 and 2013, I don't know if either quarterback has much of a chance. You know, there are, uh, there are major, major holes that have got to be fixed. And maybe that'll be fixed by experience and getting in the weight room. Maybe it'll be fixed by guys like uh, James Dunbar coming back into the fold. But uh, it, the team has got a lot of work. Casey Pahal being on the team and earning back trust and winning at the starter's job is step one of a thousand to get ready for a Big 12 championship run in 2013. I still think TC is probably going to be the favorite as we go in, and everyone's going to be talking about them as not even necessarily the dark horse. They may be talking about TCU as the front runner, uh, but that remains to be seen. We've got a long, long way to go, and it's not been all good news since the last podcast. Uh, it, there have been a number of changes in the program as far as coaches uh, leaving the program, as far as players leaving the program. Uh, Jamie, talk a little bit about the guys who have left, coaches, staff, players that you think might have the biggest impact on TCU success next year and going forward, and uh, just kind of your feelings on how these guys affected the program while they were here and, and how their absence might uh, might affect TCU in two th- 2013. You know, the biggest loss that I, I see uh, moving forward was actually Trey Haverty, the wide receivers coach. He had done such a fantastic job uh, getting these guys, getting all of these recruits ready and getting them um, get, he, he just has done such a wonderful job developing the whole wide receiver core uh, from Boyce all the way down to guys like Colby Lissenby, who came into the game against Michigan State and had a 59-yard reception after not having caught uh, a pass all season. He was still game ready and ready to go and roll in the bowl game. Um, he moves over to Texas Tech, so it's it's kind of a, a two-fold injury there where you're not only losing him, but you're losing him to an in-conference rival, uh, and he's a very good recruiter. He's a very good recruiter. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury is putting together quite the team over in Lubbock, so that's something to keep your eye on for for the rest of the, until signing day in a couple weeks, uh, and as we move forward throughout the next couple seasons with those guys putting together uh, quite the coaching staff. Um, obviously, losing Randy Shannon at linebackers coach is a is a huge blow, even though he was only here for a year. Um, I think he did an absolute miraculous job getting Marcus Mallett ready in the second half of the season. Uh, um, even though the Frogs really went with that 4-1-6 look a lot with the extra safety on the field because of our weakness at linebacker, I thought Shannon really did uh, a fantastic job getting getting Kane ready, getting Ma- Marcus Mallett and Joel Hasley ready to back him up. Um, and he moves on to Arkansas. They threw a, a ridiculous amount of money at him, so you can't blame him for leaving. Um, and as far as transfers go, there really wasn't anybody that impactful that uh, is leaving the team. The biggest one, the biggest name, I guess you could say, is A.J. Hilliard, uh, the linebacker, the true freshman that um, transferred to Texas A&M. Uh, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, is he was a special teams guy as a true freshman. He made one tackle, and despite the depleted nature of our linebacking core, he did not see a whole lot of time uh, on the field and on, in defensive sets. And so, you know, it obviously is a bummer when you lose that kind of depth. Um, but with with other guys that are coming in in this class and with the potential for a few other linebackers that are still kind of on the fence about whether or not they're going to commit to TCU, I don't see that being too devastating. Uh, other guys like Jamie Bird transferring, David Bush transferring, they uh, there, there was a lot of depth at those positions, and so that's really not um, too much of a concern from a player standpoint. Really, I, really honestly, I think the biggest loss is Trey Haverty with that uh, and what's interesting about the Trey Haverty thing and we're going to talk about recruiting in just a second here but what's really interesting about the Trey Haverty kind of situation how it played out was even before the bowl game there were a lot of rumors that he was going to leave uh, I, I think the staff and Gary tried to play that down and but you know it ended up being that as soon as the bowl game was over he was gone and since leaving there is kind of a coach's oath uh, I would say it's an unwritten rule because I don't think it's actually an NCAA violation that, you know, if you recruit said player 
to TCU and he commits to TCU, when you go to Texas Tech, for example, you're not going to out and out specifically target that kid that you had a relationship with and try to bring him to Texas Tech with you. You're not going to actively pursue him. The gray area falls in when that kid calls you and says, hey, I heard you left. And you say, yeah, I went to Texas Tech. It's this great place. Are you interested in finding out more information? And the second that kid does, then I guess that recruiter can consider that recruitment back wide open again and he's fair game. Uh, Since he left, there have been a number of guys, including guys like Josh Outlaw, Andrew Billings, Demetrius uh, or Demetrius Polite Bray, I think I'm saying that right, uh, that are guys who have been either strong TCU or considering TCU, never considering tech before, guys that Haverty was involved in recruiting and are now suddenly involved with Texas Tech. And either they're taking a visit, they've already taken a visit in the last two weeks, or they're going to take one in the next week or so. And it's not, no one has accused Trey Haverty of doing something nefarious doing something that would be against the unwritten rules per se. But I think it certainly is not out of the question to say that if a couple of those guys who are either committed to TCU or likely to TCU suddenly end up going to Tech, I think that probably off the record, there are going to be a lot of TCU coaches and administrators, Gary Patterson amongst them, that are not going to be happy, that are going to feel like their willingness to allow Haverty to interview and then ultimately take that job, which they don't have to do. Haverty's obviously under contract, was not rewarded. And their faith in him and giving him promotion after promotion and giving him a spot here in the first place on the coaching staff was not rewarded. And I, I hope that nothing happens, right? I hope we can say that all the TCU guys stay at TCU, the guys who were uncommitted, just do their own thing, and, and we don't have to worry about anything more going forward. I, I really hope that's the case. But if we see guys like Outlaws, especially Josh Outlaw, the offensive guard, who we'll talk about here in a minute, if we see guys like him leave the program uh, leave, or not stay committed or strong to TCU and end up suddenly switching, I think I'm going to have a problem with that, and I think that TCU will as well. So I agree that uh, Haverty would be a major, could be a major, major effect. And the other guy, like you said, Hillard, Hilliard transferring to a and I believe he's going to have to sit out. Or will he have to sit out a year? Have we talked about that? Has that been discussed? Uh, yeah, I mean, he saw time on the field as a true freshman in the fall this past season, so he will have to sit out a year. Okay. Um, and as far as the competition goes to Texas A&M, I wrote when he transferred that without him looking forward, uh, I think there were 18 linebackers on the roster who were committed or being recruited by, by Texas A&M at that point. Yeah. Um, so obviously he's very confident in his abilities, but he will have to sit out a year, yes. So let's talk a little bit about recruiting. This last weekend, it was much. It was written about a whole lot that TCU had a ton of guys on campus, uh, stretching back all the way to like the 15th, uh, 16th, 17th of January, a couple during the first week that weren't too, uh, too well publicized, but starting about the 15th, going through the end of the weekend that we just got through, which was through the, uh, the 20th, TCU had a bunch of guys on campus, guys who were committed and guys who were either strong TCU or thinking about visiting TCU. Uh, and we really want to highlight a couple of those names. Obviously, signing day is coming up. Frogs of War is going to have a ton, a ton of coverage on who is signing, who doesn't sign, guys who uh, announce the day of, things like that. It's all going to be at Frogs of War, so definitely keep your eyes tuned. But for now, let's talk a little bit about the guys who are uh, in the mix to head to TCU. Jamie, I'll give it, kind of throw it to you first so you can give an, an overview of, of what's, look, what's it looking like for the, the Frogs on the recruiting trail. Well, uh, one big Big name, you mentioned him earlier, is uh, Josh Outlaw. He's an offensive guard from Lithonia, Georgia. Um, he was one of the big names, along with Andrew Billings and a few other guys that came in uh, to Fort Worth this weekend for a visit. And he came away, according to him, he was absolutely blown away. Uh, if you read the superprep.com article, uh, it's a subscription article. He has TCU number one right now. Um, hopefully, it will remain that way. Um, I think he canceled a visit with Oklahoma next week. Uh, ESPN, I think, still has that on the calendar for him, but I'm, I, I, I may have misread it, but I think he canceled yeah. that that visit. He's uh, he's headed to Tech. He's headed to Tech either this week or this coming weekend, and he has said that he's going to announce after that visit. He's just got Tech okay. left, and that's it. And just to bring it back to our previous conversation, real quick, and Jamie, you can continue in a minute. He had never considered Tech until Haverty went there. Mm-hmm. Just, Absolutely you know, right. So that's another another element that plays into it. But back, Jamie, keep going. Yeah, I mean that, and, and to that point, it's frustrating. But when a guy isn't committed, and and I, I understand that there are unwritten rules. 
uh, it's it's difficult. It, it's really difficult to uh, to, to blame a, a recruiter for for going after guys that he wanted to come to his school in the first place. Um, but moving forward, uh, Andrew Billings was another big guy, the defensive tackle. Um, but it looks to me like he's actually going to wind up with the Longhorns. Um, Polite Bray, as you said earlier, was here this weekend. Travoris Johnson came back for another visit this weekend and and really reaffirmed his commitment to TCU, which was nice to see. Uh, he was being uh, courted by Oregon, but with the whole Chip Kelly leaving for the NFL business, I think that might have uh, – Ended that ended that courtship right there. Um, and Demontre Moore, another big guy that uh, was in this weekend. Um, he's got TCU pretty high on his list. But, you know, looking at the guys that we have now, I, I, I really, number one on my list to get is, is uh, Josh Outlaw. I think that with a big guard in there, he's already 6'4", 290, he's an 18-year-old. Uh, if we get a guard on the left side that can work really well, um, with our tackles, you know, I, I just, I think that shores up a lot of our issues and that gives Paul Hall or, uh, Boykin, whichever one that's back there enough time to work with, with the rest of the offense. Um, other big commits since we were on the podcast last, uh, Cameron Eccles looper. He was a wide receiver commit to Texas A&M decommitted when he saw the number of wide receivers that were committing to Texas A&M and, so. Turned around in about five days um, after his decommit, he committed to TCU, which is interesting uh, because a few days after that, his dad, Cameron, or excuse me, uh, Curtis Looper, uh, joined the TCU staff uh, coming over from Auburn as our new running backs coach, um, which is uh, interesting to say the least, simply because whenever a father follows his son, to a new school, um, it, you always qu- kind of question, oh, well, hey, what were the what were the motives there? Was, was there some sort of unwritten agreement under the table before this commitment happened? Uh, frankly, I don't care at this point because Looper is such a fantastic recruiter. And uh, speaking of that, speaking of how good of a recruiter he is, he is actually, uh, as of today, uh, talking with Derek Green, who is a big running back, a, f- a five-star running back, I believe, out of um, out of Alabama was a heavy Auburn lean before Looper left, and if if there's any way that he can get this kid to TCU, that would be uh, that would be absolutely incredible. It would take our already very strong running backs core to the next level. Um, this kid is an absolute beast. He's just an absolute beast. I, I I'm getting all gushy thinking about him, but he's six foot two twenty. He runs a four four. So uh, think about that in a backfield with a guy it's like Aaron Casey Green. Paul Hall. Yeah, so he's Aaron Green, basically, right? The guy that he's, we already yeah. have. Right. Yeah, we would have two of them. Right, right. And yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's a, that's a really good overview. To kind of give people a synopsis, not everyone follows recruiting really closely. Um, and I'll give my endorsement of the best places here in just a second. But let just to give an overview of, of what we're looking like, uh, as far as the, the commits we have, there's about uh, 19 total commits right now, depending on, on who you count, guys who are going to be gray shirting, guys who signed early and are in spring ball right now. There's roughly 19. Um, the biggest guy, I think, consensus who is committed right now is Kyle Hicks, um, which is not much of a surprise, considering that when he was committed to Texas, he was the next great thing. Um, they And... It, he, of course, everyone I think knows now so knows the story. He tore his ACL uh, early on in the fall. Uh, TCU convinced him to switch from Texas. It was a big deal at the time. And, of course, immediately Texas fans start dumping on him like he wasn't going to be any good. But he's the guy that most people, even before the switch and after, have maintained is going to be really good. Um, the other guy that most the recruiting websites have extremely highly and, and think of, I think, probably – uh, consensus as being one of the best in the class is Paul Whitmill, who is a linebacker commit uh, coming out of Bastrop, Texas. I, I think he's a guy, along with Sammy Douglas and Dak Shaw, who were all linebacker commits for TCU, three commits in the class at the linebacker position, which, as TCU fans know, is an area of extreme depth concern. All three of those guys coming in next year already committed that uh, are very strong commits are extremely strong athletes, all run a 4-6 or lower in their 40 times. Um, depending on who you look at, uh, you know, Rivals and Scout both have those guys as three-star commits. Uh, 24 or 247 Sports has Dak Shaw up as high as a four-star. 
uh, is lo- along with Ty uh, Slanina, who is a dual commit for baseball uh, and football right now coming in next year, although I think uh, he's probably going to end up staying on football. He's certainly going to have football scholarship. That's no doubt about that, but he's, he's probably going to end up staying on football, which is okay. Baseball doesn't necessarily need him. We just would like to have him. Uh, Paul Whitmill, if you go by ESPN ratings, is also very strong. They have him as a better athlete. But the point is, is that there's an extreme amount of depth in this class uh, at the linebacker position. The one position that they've been really trying to focus on but haven't had as much success is on the offensive line. They've got Patrick Morse, who's a big-time center uh, coming out of Denton, Texas, uh, already in the class. They've got uh, Easton Frommian. And Joseph Noteboom, who are both projected, uh, I think, to be at the tackle positions. Those guys are both a little bit undersized. Um, and then, of course, we heard uh, uh, last week that Lloyd Tunstall is coming in. Uh, they've they've told Lloyd that although he's a little bit undersized, probably in the six three six four range, that he probably is going to play left tackle at, for TCU. Um, it, so there is some depth there, but it it is the area of focus, and that brings me to the guys who TCU really wants and. And I think, for my money, and Jamie, you could feel free to disagree, but Horn Frog Blitz, which is the scout-oriented uh, TCU site, which is run by Jeremy Clark, which if you don't know the name Jeremy Clark, you haven't been following TCU athletics uh, on the Internet for many years. He is absolutely the authority when it comes to recruiting for TCU athletes. Um, when guys are coming in, he always has the best information when it comes to recruiting and the best information when it has to do with the football team in general, I think. Uh, the guy is great at his job. So what he did is he kind of took a look at all the guys that TC is going after right now um, and tried to rate as to what they what might happen. The biggest thing is the guy that we've already talked about, Josh Outlaw, who's being recruited as a tackle, has TCU number one. He's visiting Texas Tech in the next week, and uh, he thinks that after the 1st of February, he's going to go ahead and commit. He's not going to wait until, the, until uh, signing day. Everything that is being thrown out there says that Outlaw and his teammate uh, from high school, Polite Bray, the wide receiver, are both going to be Horned Frogs. Uh, that's, there's very little doubt about that, I think, right now. Uh, there is another guy named, last name, Banuku, uh, who I believe is a defensive tackle, or a, you could correct me on that if not, uh, Jamie. I believe he's coming in as a defensive tackle. But the biggest thing for him right now is that he he visited this last weekend and was also feeling very, very strongly about trying to commit. The fourth guy that they're looking at that's really had a lot of names uh, thrown out there is Duke Riley, who is another linebacker commit. Uh, this is a guy who's being very strongly recruited in the SEC. Uh, he, he's an extremely strong athlete. Uh, Ole Miss and LSU are his two visits coming up, Ole Miss being the primary one. He just visited Tulane. Uh, quite recently, I think it was this last weekend, his TCU visit was a couple weekends ago, and he came out with a lot of nice things to say about Tulane because it's the closest one for his family and he has a lot of teammates going there. So although Duke Riley is being really strongly recruited by TCU and I think that they have a lot of inroads there and Curtis Looper, the new linebacker, or excuse me, the new running backs coach who's just kind of a star recruiter, I think he's going to make a lot of waves. But I wouldn't be surprised if Riley doesn't make it. He's the one guy that I think a lot of TCU fans are high on right now that they think he's going to commit. And I, I kind of doubt that he's going to end up making it in. Yeah, I, I got to agree with you there. You know, I watched uh, two interviews with him, one after his um, visit to TCU and then one very briefly right before his visit to Tulane. And it sounded like he was torn. Uh, he sounded like he really liked TCU because of the winning attitude. It sounded like he got along very well with the coaches and with the majority of the players that he met. Um, but it, it, between listening to that interview and the interview of him just talking about Tulane before even having visited, uh, you, it sounds like his heart is in New Orleans. Um, I know he had a great time there this weekend. He does, like you said, have a couple teammates that are going there. It's very close for his family. Um, and, you know, you can't really blame a kid for for wanting to stay close to home. We're, we're, we harp all the time about recruiting DFW, and, and for Tulane it's – it would definitely be a big get for them, uh, and and I think Duke Riley has the right mentality just from the things that he's been saying about wanting to start a new tradition at Tulane and wanting to to kind of bring that winning attitude back to that program. You know, I think they'd definitely be uh, be very lucky to have have a guy of his caliber. And so the other names that you threw out, the other name, excuse me, that you threw out there that I want to address was Andrew Billings. 
Andrew Billings is kind of an interesting case. Um, here's a guy who is just a massive, massive human being. He's somewhere between 6'1", 6'3", and 300 and 320 pounds, depending on whose measurements you go on, right? He played defensive line and offensive line in high school, at guard specifically and defensive tackle, nose tackle. I, I think every school is specifically recruiting him as a nose tackle. Uh, and he's the kind of guy, kind of like Devontae Fields, who's going to come in with a body that either is ready to go or can be sculpted to be ready to go pretty quickly. Um, it, it, and here's kind of the, the basic wrap-up of what's happened there. Billings was believed to be a really strong Texas lean throughout the entire fall. Uh, and a lot of people had kind of moved off of Billings and thought he was going to commit or was basically what they call a silent commit, right? He's committed and he's not taking visits, but he doesn't put it down on paper because for whatever reason, who knows. But then come the end of December, he started leaking out that he was definitely going to take other official visits and that he was in no way committed to Texas. Um, and I don't know what that came from, but you'd have to believe it's that with the number of guys leaving the Texas program decommitting, he kind of saw that, you know, the writing on the wall, uh, that uh, the program maybe was not headed in the right direction. A lot of that ended up being rumor and hearsay, but that kind of stuff can still affect a program. So he visited TCU on the 18th this past weekend. Uh, he said very nice things. Uh, he was quoted on Horn Frog Blitz saying, essentially, uh, I love TCU. It is nicer every time I go. I love the people there. I love the coaches. I love everything about it. It's very highly on my list, but I'm going to continue to take my visits. Uh, he's going to take a Baylor visit this upcoming weekend the tw uh, on the 25th. And after that, he has said that he's going to go ahead and, and make his decision. He has not ruled out waiting until signing day, but he has said that after he finishes the Baylor visit, um, he's going to go ahead and, and make a decision and, and then decide when he wants to announce it. It's an interesting thing, depending on who you read. He's either a strong, really, really strong Baylor commit, and but silent, a very strong TCU commit, but silent, or a very strong Texas commit, but silent. Uh, and it, it, the national prognosticators have been kind of throwing around a lot of different stuff over the last couple of weeks about this kid. Um, I would love to have him because he seems like the kind of guy who can fit in, not as a starter, but into the rotation with guys like Chucky Pearson uh, or Chucky Hunter and, and Davion Pearson, who did a great job this year. He seems like the kind of guy who can be in the second or third wave this year and by the end of the year be working his way into the regular rotation. Right. You know, it, it's you want to have that guy because guys get injured, get, you know, guys get hurt, things happen. But I kind of find it hard to believe that he would be such a strong Texas guy and then suddenly drop off the face, the drop off the face of the earth and no longer be considering it. Most guys who really like Texas end up considering them in the end pretty strongly. I, I just, I don't know about you, Jamie. I get the feeling that he's been playing everybody. Uh, and at the end of the day, he's just going to pop out of the closet and say, okay, I'm, I'm a longhorn and that's it. Yeah. You know, I get that feeling too. Um, it, but you know, it, like you said, he's been very silent. Um, and he's kind of thrown everybody for a loop over the past month or so. And, you know, I don't particularly like the position that TCU is in with him right now. I know that he has had great times every time that he's come here. But the fact that he was a Texas lean for so long and the fact that he's visiting Baylor less than a week before signing day, I would say that if his visit at Baylor goes very well, that's going to be the freshest in his mind. He's going to be talking to Art Bryles, the closest to signing day um, face to face at least. And, you know, there, there's something to be said for, for the thing that you've done most recently. And if he gets to Baylor and has a wonderful time and then comes signing day, he's like, well, you know, I just had a great time last week at Baylor. And he's like, oh, well, yeah, at, te at Texas, you know, when I was committed there or, or it was a hard lean there, it was great. But it, sometimes you just go with what's freshest in your mind. And so that's what concerns me about that situation is that we've done everything right up to this point with this kid. And like you said, he would be uh, incredible, incredibly welcomed uh, as added depth in that defensive tackle spot. I think he would be uh, that guy that can come in and just absolutely lay the hammer down after Hunter and Pearson have worn down the interior of opposing lines. But yeah, I, I, I don't I, know. I, I see him going to Texas in the end. I really do. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think ultimately he's the kind of guy who, when he finishes that Baylor visit, he's going to call every coaching staff and say, "Hey, I gotta, I gotta think about it. You know, I appreciate it." And every single coaching staff is going to continually bombard him with we want to get one more final in-home visit we want to get and I, so this is going to get strung out i guarantee it he says he's going to make a decision but i would be i'd be willing to bet anything 
that come the 27th of January, he, we're going to find out that each team in the final three, Texas, TCU, Baylor, and who, I, you know, just because of the way our luck's been going, I'm sure Tech's going to suddenly emerge out of nowhere. And they all get a final in-home visit, right? And then it becomes, a, you know, it, it, he seems like that kind of guy. And there's one every single year. But I'll say this. People keep talking about how oh TCU is now recruiting on the Big Twelve level. I'm not I can't necessarily disagree with that because the numbers show that we're heading in that direction. But to truly be recruiting at that level, SEC, Big Twelve, Big Ten, be be that kind of team, top three or four in the league, these are the guys that you have to get in the last couple of weeks, right? The Texases, the Oklahomas, the Ohio States, the Floridas, the LSU's, they consistently get this kid who's a great athlete but who wants to string out his recruitment for a long time and is considering three, four, five schools, they get that guy, right? And maybe Curtis Looper's the closer. Maybe Lu they bring in Looper because they said we have a great organization but we need the closer. Maybe that's who Looper's going to be. But I, when we get the Andrew Billings of the world in the last couple of weeks of recruitment, that's when I'll know we've arrived, you know, and, and that's what I'm looking for. One more thing to note about recruitment that came out today that I thought was a fun thing that TC fans would – would like to see was recently Travoris or Travaris Johnson, who is a running back commit for TCU. He's a monster anywhere from six foot to six two, 215 pounds, runs a four, four, five right now, right? He's huge. There's been talk that he was going to leave for Oregon. Well, Chip Kelly left. He's no longer talking about going to Oregon to visit, right? He's mm -hmm. pretty solidly at TCU, but over the weekend, he went, he came and visited along with Kyle Hicks, who's the Texas switch at running back probably the top rated person coming in in this class according to the, all the different websites they were meeting with gary patterson allegedly and uh, having a talk and gary patterson at one point put his arms around these two and said well i've got my thunder and i've got my lightning i'm ready to go they've already <laughs> johnson being the thunder kyle hicks being the lightning obviously it, they've, they've already got nicknames i'm excited to see these two i would take a random guess that kyle hicks i would almost be positive that he's probably going to redshirt next year just because of the depth that they have tcu has there javoris johnson there's no way to know he's got a body that's ready to go right now does he have the instincts we don't know but i would love to see those two get redshirted right and then they can move through the program together like wesley and tucker kind of did until wesley phased out you know i i would love to see that happen i think those two really could be a, a very dynamic duo i agree with you um just the one concern that i would have redshirting the both of them would be then you've got two guys that have had playing time at the running back position, and one of them missed the majority of last year with an ACL tear. Um, you know, Wayman James is obviously a fantastic running back when he's healthy. BJ Catalan came a long, long way from the beginning of the season to the end. Um, but I, that that makes me a little nervous when you and of course Aaron Green. Um, again, he has not been in this system in a game situation yet, so so I consider him. Uh, kind of a question mark even though he's got uh he oozes talent uh you know red shooting both of them makes me a little bit nervous but if it happens and our current core can stay healthy it would obviously pay huge dividends in the future no doubt i don't i don't disagree with that and i think i'm sure that tc will make the best decision and you know with red shirts it's always funny there are very few times when someone is absolutely 120 percent a red shirt from August 1 through December 1, right? You have the guys more or less who are kind of maybe going to be red shirts and we'll just see how it plays out. And if they have to play, they play. And if not, if, you know, they won't. Even with Tyler Matthews last year, it, they never truly said this guy's redshirted 100%. And we saw what happened, right? You know, you know, Paul Hall goes down. Boyk has got a leg injury. Matt Brown comes in. Oh, crap. Maybe Tyler Matthews needs to play, you know? So you never you never really know until you get all the way through a season who's really who's really excuse me, redshirting and who's not. But I wouldn't be surprised if they try to push those guys as best they can uh, into that position. And, of course, that's a best-case scenario. If you can redshirt both of them, it's because everyone else was 100% healthy and productive, which never happens, let's just be honest. But uh, All right, so let's move on. Uh, I think we've had enough football for now. By the time we do this podcast again, we'll be heading towards signing day, so we'll have a lot more information at that point. Um, but... Uh, for some reason, I think we've decided to talk a little bit of TCU basketball. It hurts. Right. It hurts just to think about. Yeah. We're going to restrict this to just one topic. Uh, and let me put this in perspective. Last time we had this podcast was December the 20th. That's when we posted it in Frogs of War. Uh, TCU at that point, had, or since then, has played seven games. 
directly afterwards, they played at Rice and at home versus Mississippi Valley State. They won both those games. The next game they played was against Texas Tech, the beginning at Big 12 play. They've lost five consecutive games now. Texas Tech at home, Okie State and Baylor on the road, and then most recently, Kansas State and Iowa State at home. Uh, none of those games has been that close. Texas Tech uh, was a nine-point uh, nine point loss. Baylor was 11. We let it halftime, obviously. A lot of you watched that game. Let it halftime. We let it go. Uh, Kansas State, considering how good that team was, I thought they put up a good fight for about four minutes, which is more than I thought they would do. So that was a nice effort, but lost by 13. And then this last weekend against Iowa State, we pretty much put together, I would say, about 15 minutes uh, before losing. This team has not yet put together 20 minutes, let alone 40 minutes of very strong, consistent basketball against a good team. Uh, and I would be willing to bet that we will not win another game the rest of this year. Period. You know, I... I, I've got to I've got to just echo your sentiment that we're not going to win another game. I mean, the thing is, is when you have guys injured, like Amrick Fields, guys that were supposed to be potentially your leading scorer and one of your best rebounders and one of your best overall players go down immediately when the season begins, um, and then you lose uh, you lose two more guys on top of that that were supposed to be big contributors. You can't get consistent games and it's so frustrating to watch you can't get some consistent games from Keen anderson or garland green both have shown the ability to score both have shown the ability to get to the rim to pass the ball out to the open man but they just can't do it consistently they turn the ball over too much really when you look down to it adrick mckinney uh, is is our best player and it's not even close the guy has been the most consistent that's the guy that too by the way that he's the best player uh it's so sad it's so sad um to what and just to that point, watching him against Kansas State when they were down 22, he was the only guy still fighting. He was the only guy, uh, and it's 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 incredibly frustrating to try and watch this team who, like you said, has not put together a good half, more or less a whole game. Uh, but to their credit, they do re, they do rotate very well on defense. They they force turnovers, but when you can't turn a three and one fast break into a, a, ba- a basket and, and you can't consistently rebound, it's going to be a long season. Um, I'm, I don't know why, but I'm going to the Baylor game on Saturday uh, and I will be on bended knee begging God for a win, but I don't see it happening. I don't see another one this season. Is it at Baylor? Or, you, or no, it's at home. No, it's at home. It's at home. They just, the, the previous Baylor game was in Waco that they only lost by 11, which is makes that even even crazier to me that's right we've got west virginia at west virginia wednesday the 23rd which is probably when we're going to be posting this podcast that day and then we've got baylor on the 26th in fort worth which leads up to texas at texas which is a game you feel like you have to win because that's the other worst team in the big 12 this year and yet i watched them against kansas this weekend and dear lord i i think we're absolutely going to get annihilated their size is just going to be way way too much and they're a bad team so that says a lot about where we are yeah, I mean, Tech's a bad team. And to be honest, Mississippi Valley State hadn't won a game, and we only beat them by three. Uh, the, let's make no mistake about it. This is not a good basketball team that we're enduring this year. And one can only hope that this poor play doesn't deter any recruits from coming. Uh, that's my biggest concern at this point is is that we're going to lose Brandon Parrish or we're going to lose um, – oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm losing his name. Caviar right. Shepard. Caviar yeah. Shepard. And Michael, what's his name, from Reagan. Yeah, yeah. I just mm. – yeah, the, 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 the thing, I, I thought that too, actually, and I was afraid about it. So I went and did a little bit of digging. I'm not so much worried about Shepard or Parrish. Shepard apparently has a very dramatically close relationship with the coaching staff at TCU, along with his mom having a dramatically close relation, relationship. I mean, they, I think they're very much involved. Um, and Parrish, he's so close to TCU. He's gone, and I don't know if that, this actually could be a negative, he's gone to almost every single TCU home game as well as the SMU game. He always sits right behind the bench. I think with guys like that, they've been sold on you're coming in to start and play immediately to be a part of a bigger thing for this program. And, you know, if Brandon Parrish was to go to, say, Oklahoma State or Caviar Shepard was to go to Oklahoma State, they're they're the kind of player that will be the eighth man their freshman year and the, the sixth man their sophomore year and maybe crack the starting rotation their junior year at a really good program that's really deep right now. At TCU... As long as they play hard, play defense, they will be starting next year, both of them, right? And Shepard, maybe not just because of his size, he needs to bulk up a little bit. But, you know, it, it's I, I think we keep them 
uh, the guy who's at Mike, Michael, I can't remember his name. Do you, remember, do you have his name pulled up by any chance? No, I don't. Okay, the guy who's at Reagan High School, who's a point guard, he's kind of a 6'2", probably will be more of a swing guard at TCU. He's the guy that I'm worried about. I feel like the more coaches and recruiting uh, people get to look at him, the more his name goes around. I feel like he's the guy who could get plucked because I could see, I see an opening at Texas for a point guard. And uh, I see Rick Barnes going and grabbing him, right? You know, that that's the fear I have on him. But the other two guys are pretty solid. And it looks like there's two or three more spots in this class. It looks like we're mostly going to stay Juco. Um, there's been a couple stories out this week that we're offering some top 10, top 20 Juco kind of guys that look like they probably will commit um, or be pretty close to committing. And I think Trent Johnson's doing a good area when it, or doing a good job when it comes to the recruiting area. But, uh, it, you know, even I, the, the most depressing thing for me is when you look at the layout of this team, and we'll end this conversation here, even if you add Brandon Parrish, Caviar Shepard, and Michael whatever his name is from Reagan, right now, how much better is this team, right? And that's with McKinney, who's a senior, and that's with Garland Green, who's a senior. Those guys will not be here next year. Sure, we'll have Amrick Fields and Jarvis Ray, Ray being fairly overrated in my opinion, back next year. But, you know, it's just... This team needs two to three years of this same level of recruiting at a bunch of different positions for it to get back to NCAA level, right? Otherwise, yep. we're a six-man rotation if we want to stay in competition most nights with most top-level teams. And uh, you know, you just can't do that in baseball and basketball game, game after game. Guys just get worn out, and then you're done. You know, so it, it's we're getting there, right? Where we think the next step is on the horizon, but just watching this year has just been so damn depressing. Yeah, I mean, it is like you said, it's baby steps, and so we're gonna have to struggle. But uh, you know, let's just let's let's throw that on the back burner for now. We've got a really exciting time right ahead of us, knocking on the door. Baseball season is nigh upon us. Uh, you started your previews uh, this week. You just published the outfield preview today. So uh, before we get into that, though, I want to talk about a huge recruit that we landed last week, Justin Twine, a top consensus top 30 infielder. Um, at this moment, tell me, what is your opinion? What's the percentage, uh, the likelihood of him actually making it to campus versus getting drafted in the first three rounds? Well, you know, doing those kind of percentages at this point is pretty is pretty much just folly on whoever tries. Um, the problem being that, you know, Twine has just gone through his first real uh, swing of doing MLB showcases, doing paid showcases with his team so that scouts and college recruiters really got their first eyes on him. He's just he's just finishing that coming into the spring and he's going to start his high school season here coming up in a little bit and he'll probably do some showcases throughout but then he'll start the showcase kind of tournament tour again this coming summer. After that tour is done, which will probably be June, July through uh, September, October ish, as that ends towards is that gets towards ending and then ends we'll know a lot more about where he is. Right now, after the first swing through, most talent evaluators that write for the public um, have him consensus top 20. Some have him as low as you know 20 or 30 as far as uh, MLB draft for high schoolers ranking him. Some have him as high as top 10. Um, he's probably the number one, two, three, or four guy coming out of the state of Texas in 2014, which is usually a good barometer. Texas produces a ton of major league baseball talent uh, right next to California. So it'll be interesting to see at that point. I won't say what his draft status will be, um, but it's going to be high, right? He's not going to be the kind of guy that's just going to fall off the face of the earth. Um, he is absolutely uh a dynamically talented player. The brief that I can give on you, uh, give you from him, which I got from the TCU coaching staff last week, is very basic. He is essentially a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. People say he's a Bo Jackson prototype. That's not fair uh, to hold him to that level. He's not that good of an athlete, um, but he was being recruited as an athlete slash running back by uh, Baylor, TCU football, Sam Houston State, Texas, Texas A&M, Texas Tech were all looking at him at football as well. Uh, yeah, he was 20, he was rated as a four star recruit for running back. Yeah, twenty yeah twenty four seven Sports had him as a four star level recruit, about a ninety or so, which puts him at about the level of Kyle Hicks right now, who's coming into TCU to play football. So that tells you the kind of athlete he is. I mean, he's he's ripped, he's very fast and quick. But the thing is, is as good as that guy is. He is better as a baseball player. He's what they call a five-tool player, um, meaning that he can hit for average. Uh, he can hit for power. He has dynamic speed. Uh, 
as far as it being just a, a baseball player in the infield or outfield defensively. He has dynamic speed uh, on the base paths. Uh, he, tremendous leader. I mean, a great, great head on his shoulders. Uh, you know, he, he, I mean, literally anything and everything that you could say about him is true. And when yeah, MLB fielding, throwing power, that kind of stuff, he's just he's top notch in all of it, isn't he? Yeah, no, it, literally, he hits all five categories. Uh, you know, and a lot of people, the thing with TCU and and top, <coughs> excuse me, top flight recruits is they take a look at guys like Matt Perk <clears throat> or Mitchell Traver who uh, Mitchell Travers currently on the team, obviously Perk a few, few years removed. Those guys were both guys who going heading towards the draft were guys who people thought they're, they're going to go in the top five rounds. Perk went in the first round. Traver was supposed to, injured his arm, fell to about the 39th round or so. Both ended up at TCU for dramatically different reasons, which is why I'm, there's no reason to write off Twine making it to TCU. It's totally possible that he could. Uh but the difference between Twine and, and those guys just on a very basic baseball level is if you are a projected five-tool player who has his highest rated tool is his hit tool, meaning he can hit for average. He's a guy that they think at his peak as a pro is going to hit uh, over 300 consistently as a pro. If you have scouts saying that about you, you are going to go in the top five rounds. It doesn't matter what your body is. He could be 100 pounds overweight, be a lazy horrible kid you know doesn't take care of himself from a horrible background and they're still going to draft him that high because they know if they can fix the mental stuff they're going to get him to the point where he's playing baseball and, and hitting this kid doesn't have a single one of those problems has the best body you'd ever want is a dynamic athlete smart does the right stuff <clears throat> has a great background great parents and he has that kind of phenomenal talent it's just one of those ridiculous combinations that uh, as long as he keeps what he has going right now and does not falter, if he just carries what he has through for another year, he's looking at a million dollars minimum. So it, you know, it's a fun thing for TCU fans to dream about. I'm going to dream about it. TCU coaches are going to be on his butt consistently for the next year and a half. Um, if they get him to campus, that is easily the greatest recruiting win for TCU sports ever. And I mean that, right? If he is at the level that we think he's going to be at and they get him to come to campus and he's not injured or anything like that and there's not some weird thing with Perk like the Rangers couldn't sign him. If he just purely decides, nope, I'm going to TCU, you know, right now his uh, his committing coach, not a signing coach, but his committing coach um, was Tony Vitello, who is an incredible recruiter, recruiting coordinator for baseball team. I, I I hope some donor would write him a million dollar check because he deserves every dollar of it. It'd be that good. But uh, for now, we'll just get to enjoy how cool it is to have such an amazing athlete committed to, to the program and, and then just get ready for 2013. Absolutely. You know, and, and on the topic of 2013, like I mentioned earlier, your uh, positional previews began today uh, with the outfield. So why don't you recap that post for us a little bit and give us a give us kind of a, an image of what's going to be happening in our outfield this year. Yeah, and I, I meant to put up the schedule at the top of the post. I forgot to do it. I'll try to remember to do it when I get back to my office um, tomorrow. Outfield obviously dropped today. Infield's going to be on Friday. We're going to be on a mostly Monday-Friday schedule going through to uh, till up until the week of the season when we're going to be playing out Ole Miss, obviously. But today, the, the major thing was the outfield, uh, and the biggest thing that fans can get, I, I encourage you to go read the piece because there's a ton of information recapping where we were and recapping and now talking about where we're going to be. You know, consider TC fans that your outfield for the last couple of years has been Jason Coates in left field, Kyle Von Tunglin or Aaron Schultz in center field, and then Branch Rivera in right. You've had that for about the last three years for almost every game. Um, none of those guys are here this year. You know, two of them have MLB contracts, uh, or they have contracts with the MLB teams. Branch is obviously, uh, he's, he's graduated and he's going to go off and do great things. Uh, but those kind of, that rock, which has been the offensive and leadership rock for TCU for the last couple of years, is gone. And so when you have to replace that amount, both offensively in the clubhouse, uh, in the outfield, just having new names out there, it's tough to do. It's not easy. But, you know, again, credit the TCU coaching staff. They have brought in the guys that they will need to go ahead and stabilize, not necessarily replace. I don't think that they will duplicate what uh, VT and Coates and Rivera have put up there the last couple of years, but I do think that they're going to supply a lot. Uh, the guys that you look at are Brett Johnson in left field, who everyone knows. He's been around for a couple of years now. He's kind of an enigma. You 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 always think he's going to break out offensively. Every once in a while, he'll have that game where he goes three for four, four for five, with a home run and a double, and he and he looks like the next uh, the second coming of like Adam Dunn or Barry Bonds. 
but he, he, then in the next game after that, he strikes out three times and he and he loops out really softly to left field and and he never can put it together consistently enough for Sloss to keep him in the lineup. And I don't, I don't blame him. You know, he, it's just you have to play the guys that are hitting. He moved to the outfield in the fall, the left field or right field. To me. I think he's primarily probably going to play in left. Um, maybe not to start the year. He might play more right, but uh, ultimately he's a left fielder. His range is okay. Arms is pretty good for an outfielder, and I think he'll be pretty good there. You won't see much of a drop-off defensively in left field. The guy who's taking over in center is really actually going to be pretty dynamic. That's Cody Jones, uh, Juco transfer. He is an absolute speed demon on the base pass. The coaching staff actually fought really, really hard to keep his name quiet, that he had committed to TCU because they didn't want, number one, other schools coming in and getting him. And number two, they had some other outfield recruits coming in and Kevin Daniels um, and Dylan Fitzgerald that they didn't they wanted to stay committed. And they knew that if Cody Jones was coming in, they realized they might have lost some playing time. But he's once it was came became known this fall that he had was in the program immediately. I started getting emails from people saying Cody Jones is a dynamic player. I've seen him play. He's he's an absolute flyer on the base pass. And that's where his his talent talent is. He's a speed guy faster than Vaughn Tunglin. Um, not as impressive offensively. He's not going to be the kind of guy who can just take over a game. What you'll see Cody Jones do offensively is slap the ball around, singles, uh, maybe a few doubles. He'll get the uh, mistake triple every, every once in a while. Um, I, his main focus is going to be use his speed to get on base, and then once he's on base, use his speed to move around. That's really where his game is going to be. Uh, I think he's going to be, as far as his slash line is concerned, um, he's going to be kind of in the 280, 290 with hopefully a 400 or above on base percentage. And that's really where he needs to be. But he could also be in the 20 to 30 steals range. I mean, he is that fast if he stays healthy. So and defensively, he's he's awesome. I think he's probably going to end up people regard him as the best defensive center fielder that we've had this uh, during this century. Right. You know, the last 12 years. He's very good, very good range, great arm, good instincts, um, plays with a high motor. You'll just, the first thing you'll notice about him is when you see him on the field, he's kind of like Brian, uh, Brian Holiday was. He just is always moving, and it's, it's going to be really fun to watch. Uh, right field's kind of an enigma. Uh, right now it looks like coming out of the fall, Dylan Fitzgerald, uh, who is a JUCO transfer, I believe from Blinn. I could be getting that wrong. I believe he's from Blinn. Uh, he is... He's the guy who's fitting in there right now, but I I feel kind of scary saying that he's the guy who's going to fit in at right field because I actually don't know that, um, and I'm willing to bet that he actually won't be. And the reason I say that is because it's just it's kind of a toss up right now. Uh, they slot they've slotted him in there, he, and actually he's not from Blinn. He's from Cypress College. Sorry to make sure I have that right. Cypress, not Blinn. They slotted him in there because he's an incredible defensive player. Um, he was Defensive Player of the Year, Defensive MVP uh, at Cypress last year. Uh, offense is uh, steadily okay, you know, steadily mediocre, which is not what you want from your right fielder. I mean, at, at Cypress, I think he was in the 280, 290 range. Um, does not have a tremendous amount of power. He's not going to be a big slug guy. Um, I, I think TC will probably work with him to be a more uh, selective hitter, so we could probably see the on-base percentage tick up a little bit, and he is pretty fast, so y- you could see some some strong effort on the base pass. But the problem is, is that, you know, last year when Brands Rivera went down with an, uh, or not didn't go down with an injury, but was just not performing, you kind of, you kept rolling him out there every week because you wanted him to succeed, uh, and because he brought hustle and defensive ability and consistency, and he was a leader, and you don't want to bench your leader. That's not going to happen this year, right? Brett Johnson, Dylan Fitzgerald, Cody Jones, none of those guys have any kind of cred built up at the team. So if they're not producing offensively, they're really bottoming out. They're going to get pulled. So Fitzgerald is the guy I'd say is right, is in that spot right now. Two weeks from now, it could be different. The backup at all of those spots, the primary backup, the guy who could slot in really easily is Kevin Daniels. He's a transfer in from Blinn College. Uh, similar to Cody Jones, extremely fast. Uh, pretty high batting average last year at Blinn. He was in the 330 range. I don't think he's going to bring that over to TCU, but if he could be a 290 guy, slapping a lot of singles and then also running when he gets on base that's a good nine hole hitter uh the problem is you don't want your left or right fielder hitting ninth no matter what his batting average is and how many bases he can steal right if you're doing that it means that you're getting a ton of offense from another position which we'll talk about when we talk about the infield on friday but uh it's gonna all of these guys have to consider 
or we have to consider them as offense first players. Uh, Cody Jones gets the most leeway because he's playing a defensive, defensively important position in center field, but all of them have got to produce at the end of the day. If they don't produce, you're going to see one of them move. Um, it, the guys that could take over, Jarek Suter, he should have been your opening day right fielder. Um, he's got a little bit of an injury right now that's restricting him from throwing, so they're going to go ahead and DH him prob- probably to start at the beginning of the year. Um, he will move, I th- if everything goes according to plan, uh, and back to the outfield, back to right field pretty quickly. Um, and I think if everything goes well with the catching situation, he'll probably stay in right, uh, maybe do a little bit of left, maybe back up in center if he needs to. Uh, if they need him to catch, that'll be really late on in the season uh, when you know it would be a situation where they fully feel his arm is back to full health, but it's going to depend on his recovery. Uh, so what? But he'll be DHing to start the to start the year for the most part. If it's not Suter though, or Kevin Daniels or Dylan Fitzgerald, uh, it, it could be a, a massive rotation of guys. Um, uh, Travis Hennessy is a guy who's a he just he's a freshman. He came in as kind of like a left-handed pitcher slash outfield. With the amount of pitching that this team has right now, they prob- they've really been focusing him on offense. He's got a ton of potential. He's a great athlete. He just hasn't put it all together yet. But a young kid like him, he'll probably figure it out. He'll play this year. Uh, he won't redshirt, I don't think. But it, I don't think he's going to figure in a, pl- a lot of playing time early on. Boomer White's a big name, a big name that I like. I think he's got really strong offensive potential. He was a catcher in high school, though, and the reason is is he's not the greatest at moving and tracking balls. Um, I think he might be able to survive in left field. If he's a really strong offensive player, you want to put him out there because he can get his bat in play. But he's also a guy kind of like Axel Johnson, who when he went out there last year in left field, I literally was just putting my head in my in my uh, in my lap, and I didn't want to watch because I knew he was going to miss play a ball, and he did. Um, and Boomer White's kind of at that area right now. I want his bat in the lineup, but we don't know where we're going to put it. The other name that we'll, you'll see out there a lot is Colton Turner, uh, who's another freshman coming in from Round Rock, Texas. Colton's a phenomenal athlete. I think he's going to make a big impact on TCU by the time he's done if he stays with it. He's probably the kind of guy who's going to end up redshirting this year. Um, it depends, number one, what injuries look like. Depends what the depth looks like. You know, it, certain guys aren't working hard. They might put Colton in there and push him, but they would prefer to redshirt him and have him uh, pick it up next year when they might have a couple openings due to guys leaving from the draft and things like that. So that's what the outfield looks like. It's going to be a totally different group from what you've seen the last couple of years. The offensive focus in the team is going to dynamically shift to the infield, which is both good and bad. The biggest thing for the defense is going to be they have to be as good defensive, or the biggest thing for the outfield, I should say, is they have to be as good defensively as we think they're going to be at a minimum, and then they have to go ahead and produce. Uh, and if you don't produce, the next guy's coming up. And if that guy doesn't produce, the next guy's coming up. And it's just going to be a cycle until they find the right rotation of guys. Um, it, I almost guarantee that whatever rotation we start with in the Ole Miss series is not going to be the rotation that we go with for Texas at the end of the year. It's going to be different. But either way, there's talent there. There's a lot of defense, a lot of speed, and I can't wait to get them on the field. It should be a really fun group uh, to watch at the least. Well, I mean, that sounds great, and it's going to be really exciting as we get into the season to see who really kind of jumps off the field and on and on to the, you know, onto the scene. It's, you know, like you said, with so many big names leaving that have been kind of stalwarts on this team over the last few years, those young guys are going to have to step up, and that's going to be really exciting to watch. Um, we've eclipsed the hour mark. So really quickly, I know you wanted to make one point at least about the infield that's coming up on Friday. Uh, so go ahead and give us your one, one point on the infield and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for the you. You know, yeah, it's funny. We always say that we're not going to do this for that long and then we end up just talking forever. Right. You know, but that's so thing. much to cover, right? You just need to call me more often so we can chat. <laughs> right? Now the, the quick thing on the infield, you guys will read it in the preview. Um, I've had a chance to talk with the staff, the coaching staff, a fair amount about this, uh, um, what you'll see is is that they are going to be a very dynamic group. Um, I, I think they're easily the best infield in the Big 12. It's it's really not that close. Texas has some very strong players in Eric Weiss, uh, uh, but there's some question marks, some freshmen there. We'll have to see what happens. The biggest thing for TCU is going to be uh, health, making sure that everyone stays healthy, figuring out who's going to be playing at shortstop, um, and figuring out kind of if Kevin Crone has really worked on his body, He's they the staff is really happy with him. They're very impressed. Um, is he going to be that guy defensively? We don't know. 
you know, we will uh, we'll find out. So look for the infield preview on Friday. Should be a lot of fun. And then next week, uh, I th- catch it, catchers and DH maybe, and maybe even a little starting pitching. We'll have to we'll have to take a look. But we're under less than thirty days away from first pitch at Ole Miss, and probably going to be Bobby Wall for Ole Miss, major draft prospect. We played him. We played against him in the Super Regional, or excuse me, the Regional last year, and down at College Station, and either Preston Morrison or Brandon Fittigan in all likelihood for TCU. And uh, that Friday game, there has been some rumors that it could get bumped to TV, but otherwise right now it's scheduled for 3.30. So go ahead and mark off that you're taking a half day on that Friday and uh, and uh, flip on the radio for some great TCU baseball. But uh, otherwise, I think that's going to wrap it up because I know that I'm, exa- I'm exhausted. <laughs> Yeah, same here. <laughs> we actually do have day jobs, people. I mean, we can't just sit around talking TC sports, although it seems like we do, right? But we we appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to listen to the Frogs of War podcast um, and for checking out Frogs of War every day for everything that's related to TCU athletics. Um, we should have a lot of fun announcements coming up this spring, including uh, things like guest commentary, including a former TCU baseball player uh, having a column on the website, which should be an immensely fun thing for us, something you won't find anywhere else. Uh, that we're really excited about. But otherwise, thank you for tuning in. For Jamie Plunkett, I am Patrick McCullough. It's been an honor, and uh, we will catch you next time.